<laughs> okay. So you really want to know, huh? Fine. I'm going to start by telling you this. And this is important, so listen up. Your entire life, this one and many others, you've been a god who uses its absolute power to make yourself powerless. Entire cultures, especially this one, have all been afraid of their weaknesses, supposedly. When in reality, they've all been afraid of their power. This goes beyond the matrix of reality. This is something much deeper than that. This is eternal. This is fully realizing your consciousness. This is infinite. This is evolution. This is our divine right. Welcome everybody to the podcast, Bootsy Greencast, uh, because it sounds better than Bootsy Green Pod, or at least I think it does. I'm really excited today. I have an awesome, awesome guest on, and he's had some amazing things happening in his life. Um, I first want to give a shout out real quick to Content Safe for distributing this piece of content all over the internet, the deepest reaches, man. You know, this is going to be out there for a long, long time. So I try to I try to watch myself on my own podcast. I'm over here policing myself just so that way, you know, I don't get retroactively canceled. But today's guest, super awesome dude. He's doing a lot in the community and I'm really, really excited to have him. We've been chatting for uh, for a while and finally had the time to have uh, a conversation. So Mark from My Family Thinks I'm Crazy. Yeah, I think we can all relate there. Welcome to the podcast, my friend. Bootsy, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to get into some some topics. I yeah, see you're, you're a mystical guy. I love that intro. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, my buddy Oscar did that. And it's just it's just awesome. When I heard that song, I was like, dude, can I please use that for um, for an intro? And he was like, absolutely. So I mean, man, I mean, that that thing lasts the test of time. It's, it's awesome. So I have your website pulled up here. You have a podcast. My family thinks I'm crazy. Uh, questioning reality. Yeah, that's a man aren't we i think you should be look at all this stuff uh, conspiracy uh, mystery intrigue Ooh, intrigue that's a sexy word uh spirituality paranormal supernatural alternative ancient lost and forbidden knowledge i first heard of you on sam tripley's podcast the tinfoil hat you were on there and you were kind of sort of playing devil's advocate for um uh what's that guy's name alistair crowley 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 crow 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 i think it's crowley uh and uh, and you did such a good job because sam was like coming off the handle man he was losing it talking about what a piece of shit this guy was which i think is a valid point but you did such a good job of being like now listen i'm not advocating for the guy i'm just telling you the story of why people like this guy so much and i laughed my ass off dude at that show and i thought you handled yourself just marvelously well. And uh, as soon as I heard that, actually, that's the first time we uh, we messaged back and forth. I was like, hey, man, you, that was a great show. And we've been yes. chatting ever since and finally was able to hunt you down. So thanks again for coming on. Yes, yes. Thank you for enjoying that. I enjoyed the conversation <laughs> a lot. And, uh, you know, my mom always used to tell me when I was a kid, like, oh, you're pretty good at arguing. You might as you might want to think about becoming a lawyer. And, you know, I I lost, uh, you know, I, I think I lost Sam on my point because my initial reasoning for doing that research was I saw all of these podcasts about Aleister Crowley. I listened to them and I walked away thinking a bunch of things. I had mixed thoughts. I'm like, well, you know, some people say he's the worst. Some people say he's not that bad. You got some people talking about him like he's some kind of punk rock mystic. So I'm like, let's set the record straight. Let's do a biographical, uh, you know, event by event by event. Look at his life. And I thought that was just so interesting going through his life. And then that culminated into me having the position of being like, listen, I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not a judge. OK, I'm just going to tell you what I found. And quite honestly, there wasn't you know, there wasn't a court case. There wasn't a, a, a criminal investigation. There wasn't any police activity that could be because he's one of these rich, protected people, big players. We know he was in the espionage community and, and things like that. So I just like to be safe and comfortable in the position of being like, listen, here's what I've found. 
and you can make your own conclusion. And I think when you're talking about accusing someone of something that graphic and evil, you have to really be careful and be responsible about how you condemn other people. Because, you know, even though he's dead, he possibly has family. I don't know. But, you know, either way, it, I would want that same respect for any of uh, my family members. And I think it's just that's where Sam and I uh, maybe didn't see and had that misunderstanding that I wasn't trying to defend him. I was just trying to make the case of like, well, here are all the facts. I'm not going to jump to any conclusion. And that made him feel like, well, you just, you know, like I was right. teasing him the whole time. So, and, and it was also like 2020 was super charged with that, with the QAnon stuff and really putting that thing out there for people to be like, oh, this celebrity is doing this and this celebrity is doing this and this celebrity is doing this. And Crowley was like a celebrity of his time. And he really was like mixed up with a lot of these filmmakers when he came to Hollywood and he was mixed up with all these socialites in Europe. And he was mixed up with people who you would think are like, holy crap, how did he know all these people from Jack the Ripper to L. Ron Hubbard to, you know, uh, Ian Fleming? I mean, the the amount of people that Aleister Crowley interacted with, he really was, you know, deserving of his spot on that Beatles album cover. You know, he really did fit in this kind of 20th century zeitgeist of like what it is to be human. And, and I think why I initially was even fascinated with him in the first place wasn't because of his like evil punk rock persona. I wasn't a goth kid. I actually didn't like any of that shit. I was a captain of my wrestling team. I got along with those kids, but I wasn't one of them, you know? I wasn't putting eyeliner on my face. So like when people see that episode, they might think that's who I am and not at all. And where I really became fascinated with Crowley was his, his drive to expose these esoteric things and make them public. Right. And the good and the bad, I mean, and he wasn't a perfect person. So in that transparency is some honesty i think and and he was honest about so many things that were kept secret for thousands of years of course he was characterized as an evil person i mean there were powerful people who were relying on those things being secret and he quite literally <laughs> made uh his whole life about exposing some of these esoteric rituals and really, it was a reaction to his strict Christian upbringing. So, you know, I, I related to that because, like, I grew up uh, in Connecticut as a Roman Catholic, just kind of going into church and seeing the priest in a funny green robe, like, sing a, a song that we didn't even understand. It was in Latin. And meanwhile, we're all, you know, speaking, like, slang English. <laughs> and they're trying to, you know, get us to feel holy about something that is in Latin. I mean, it just it. As a kid, I had that reaction to become atheist. And then over time, my spiritual intuition grew. And I can thank people like Crowley for kind of helping narrate the way. You know, he wasn't the end of the road, not at all. He was like one of those scary trolls that you got to like get a few questions through and then cross the bridge. And I'm totally. past him now, you know, and yeah. it's funny because like some people have hit me up to be like, oh, you got to do a series on Crowley. You got to do more podcasts on Crowley. And I'm like, quite honestly, like I've read a lot and I, I'm just not quite, you know, I don't want to do that right now. Like maybe maybe in the future I will. But like he's not he's not the whole thing. But I really you know, I love that people enjoyed that episode i mean i don't think i've ever been on any podcast that's gotten that many views so it certainly helped my podcast uh get off the ground you know so yeah it was a it was an interesting confluence of things i mean crowley certainly it can be like a sigil in that sense of like i was boosted up by his magnanimous uh energy yeah interesting well put so yeah since you mentioned your podcast my family thinks i'm crazy tell me a little bit about like that how that what's the genesis of that how, how did you get started doing that and and what what inspired you to, to begin it well i'm really on a roll so i'm going to go into a story that maybe other people have heard but i never told it with this detail so sam we mentioned sam you know it's such an honor working for sam and having the opportunity like even though we did kind of clash and butt heads on that episode like really nothing but respect him and and like the next week he had me back on his patreon to kind of air the beef out even though there was no beef he just saw that i was getting a lot of negative comments on my own youtube channel so um so 
I'm working for him, you know, like he, he hired me around that same time. And I started looking, you know, at all these different spiritual Naman is zero and getting people that were such, you know, high caliber that he was like, Oh, I'm going to have you work for me on Tim fall hat. And then, you know, that was just such an exciting stellar feeling of like, wow, I went from like, being a fan of something like it felt like I stepped into TV, you know, like I was such a huge fan of this, like, com, you know, comedian conspiracy theorist guy out in LA. It was like, he only existed in my mind as like a fragment of my uh, imagination almost, you know? And then next thing I know I'm working for him. So I'm like, so excited. I tell my family about this and it really is like a culmination of so many things that I've done throughout my life of like, researching these esoteric things like i would go to thanksgiving and christmas family gatherings with like these books just because i knew like oh i'm probably not going to talk much i'll probably get a chance to read some of this and then that maybe would give people an opportunity to talk to me about something i'm interested in because for so many <laughs> years i felt like ah, i don't really have a lot of people to relate to you know mm. Uh, so it was a culmination of all these things that I've been interested in. So I really just felt like, oh, here's my purpose. I am exalted in this. Like I'm working for Sam Tripoli. I'm helping him find really interesting people. I've been listening to podcasts for like three years straight. So I know all these really great people that he should talk to. And I go to tell my family about this. And they're all at their nice little lake house in Connecticut that they rented for the summer. Really lovely, really grateful. I'm not disrespecting them. I love my family so much. But when I tell them this, they're like, who's Sam Tripoli? <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, God. And I drive away and like that week, like Sam and I had talked and I hadn't really come up with a name for my podcast yet because my old podcast just had like a kind of more generic name and just didn't fit. And Sam was like, yeah, you got to come up with a new name for your podcast before you get on tinfoil hat. That way, you know, you have your show ready. And so after that conversation with my family, I'm like, my family thinks I'm crazy. And then that just like stuck with me and I'm driving home <laughs> I'm like, Oh, my family thinks I'm crazy. That's the name of the show. And I like thought out the acronym and I'm like, M F T I C perfect. That's actually like not a bad acronym. And then like, you know, and I just, it all came together there. And really why I think that fits is because every time I've ever read a book about something strange like this or heard a theory or heard a new like method to improve your life. My first instinct is to go tell someone about it. My first instinct is to go like share it with a friend, share it with whoever's closest. And, you know, that can become kind of a task for people to know someone like me because every week I'm hitting you with like 10 paragraphs of an essay you didn't even know I wrote or, you know, like why, you know, why every time I talk to Mark, I got to hear a whole diatribe on ancient aliens, you know, like, so for a while there, again, it felt like even though I had people who were interested, I wasn't really relating with many people. Like people were interested in the stuff that I was obsessed with, but it was hard to find someone who could meet me at that level, right? Where I could have a conversation like this, where, you know, there's an even give and take. And, um, and yeah, that's what I try to do on my show is, is find people that I can have that conversation with and really just ask the questions that I want to ask so that other people can then have those thought provoking moments that maybe inspire them to be a little more uh, knowledgeable next time something does come up at a family gathering because i think i've done a pretty good job of convincing uh my family members of a lot of things the problem is is i'm not convincing myself because they know me they've seen me since i was a kid so they have this idea of me and like maybe if they didn't have this idea of who i was my ideas would be a little more uh, accepted accepted yeah. yeah but there's this kind of you know your family has this idea like oh that's just mark you know and so i love my podcast in that sense because it's giving me the opportunity to connect with people who a 
care b it's like they find me so i don't have to go and like bother people with this stuff and c it, it just yeah it's really an honor to talk to people like brad olson or david matheson or alex akaris or the grimerica show guys you know like these are all people that i've either a read their book or listened to their show or heard their them interviewed before like michael wan for example i interviewed michael wan we hit it off and then i was traveling through pennsylvania so i stayed a night at his place nice. and then like a couple of weeks later i stayed at his house again you know now we're we're pretty good buddies he's twice my age but you know we're buddies you know and and i think that's something that podcasting is really uh done for me and if you ask my like high school guidance counselor like what the hell i was ever gonna do like I don't even think podcasting was a word back then, you know, right. like it might it probably was five years old back then. So this job that I have, like it was totally unforeseen in my, in the sense of like, I didn't actually believe I could do something that was in line with these strange passions. And now here I am trying to work it out and carve it out, you know, and I think I, I've, I've done pretty well and been very grateful for the blessings and the opportunities I've had, but you know, it doesn't always translate to you know, how my family perceives what I'm doing, which makes this the title of my show more and more true every day. Oh, dude, I can totally relate to that. I can't tell you how many Thanksgivings and Christmases I've practically ruined trying to convince, you know, people in my family of what I've learned uh, from books, the internet, I mean, you know, the whole, the whole bit and I had to just eventually just give up, you know, like, cause I'm like, you know, I'm just not even going to say anything. I'm just going to let you guys talk and I'm just going to have another piece of cheesecake. You know what I mean? Like just, uh, just shove it in there, you know, bury it deep. But, you know, I think that what 2020 did for a lot of us was it brought us together, you know, like it brought this community closer and tighter and, you know, I started meeting more and more people who have similar values that were aligned, you know, like I'm going to actually, I got the, have the opportunity to go and be a part of a Grimerica retreat actually in uh, February of next year, you know, in contact person. at the cabin. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Magic, Magic on the mountain with Joe Roop and Brandon Powell. And, um, that's myself. awesome. I just had Joe Roop on my show. That episode's going to be coming out on uh, the 20th. Awesome. Yeah. So I was just on his show. And so there we go. Case in point of like this community really just starting to come together more and more and more. And I couldn't be happier about that because there's so many people that I just admire for, for speaking the truth, you know, and coming out and talking about what they've learned, what they've processed and however, the, you know, however that looks like. Um, I just, I just really appreciate it. And, uh, and so it's cool to be able to chat with you and, and to see that you're having some momentum going with this show and connecting with more and more people and, and the, the, the circle's getting tighter and tighter and we're learning and growing and standing on the shoulder, standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, uh, and uh, it's pretty freaking awesome. So. Yeah. And to that point about like standing on the shoulders of giants, I think what's cool about podcasting, it is such a, you know, symbiotic relationship. Like I can be on your show, you can be on my show and it's not detrimental to me. It's not detrimental to you. Maybe we take time out of our day, but it's time we enjoy uh, giving to each other. And in that sense, now we're giving a moment that stands like a time capsule in time. People can find it years later and have a moment. And I think what was, you know, we brought up the Grimerica show, what really like made me so want to be in podcasting when I was an Amazon delivery driver and I listened to like eight hours of podcasts every day <laughs> on my route, just like smoking blunts in the Amazon van, throwing packages on people's doorsteps and listening to Sam Tripoli yell or Darren and, and Graham get into some stuff at like a low mutter, uh, you know, or the higher side chats was another really. But my point being is like, as I'm on this route, you know, you're out there in the world every day is different with your route which was interesting you know i don't know how much you care about amazon delivery i don't anymore but what was awesome was like the routes were different every day so you're driving on this path that some fucking ai program created for you the night before and the synchronicities that occurred over and over and over as I just lived this two year existence as a delivery driver. And I was a delivery driver for other places before, but when I was with Amazon, it was particularly fast paced and long hours. So I really got into uh, podcasting as like a escape. And 
I noticed the synchronicities, whether it was like a house number that related to what the person was talking about, or like a bird flying right in front of my car, like as something was being said that was particularly powerful or like, you know, and always a red tailed hawk too, by the way, like that, something I spoke about with uh, Cheney on her podcast, her new podcast is like animal totems. Uh, but the synchronicities that kind of weave together uh, with podcasts, like one episode relating to the next, and I chose those randomly, like, you know, they're not in order. It's not like I picked two new episodes. I just picked, you know, episode 381 and then randomly episode 448, and they both connected, you know, and those were the synchronicities that started to stack up. And they, at first, maybe are mundane, but over time, I realized like, no, this is calling me into something like this is something I want to do. This is something I want to participate in. And it's something that I was already kind of doing. Like I was having these conversations right. off the air ever since I was like in high school, you know, and I I started, you know, me and my buddy who's a musician and had a mixer. We bought some like cheap mics and we did it in his old apartment. And then he moved out of that apartment and we couldn't do it for a while. And then COVID happened and I'm like, oh, wow, all of these programs are online. I can just download them. And it was a learning curve of how to actually do this. But once I figured out the technology, I realized like, oh, OK, this is easy. Let me do it. Boom, bang, boom. And now I'm helping other people with my network. Like I have a, a cooperative that I founded, which I'd love to invite you to be a part of. We can have your, your show on our website for free, no obligations. Cool. And um, yeah, what, what I do with Alt Media United is create a place for people to find new content, but also help those people on our cooperative figure out like, oh, Am I getting the best deal on hosting? Am I using the right recording program? Which mic should I get? That's the best bang for my buck. You know, who's what, what's the best guest for this topic? You know, things like that, that you know, I want to build this community. And I think everybody can build a community like that. Like, I don't want Alt Media United to be the Amazon of podcasting or anything close to that. I think what would, what's cool is like right now we're getting folks uh, that are starting to hit us up to be a part of Alt Media United. So we started with like 25 or so podcasts that I kind of had a relationship with and convinced to be a part of it. And, you know, a lot of really cool things are in store, things that I'm not ready to talk about because that's just kind of the nature of the business. But as far as our public side, the cooperative side of things, it's like, I'm really excited to have this uh, community built and it all really weaves together what I've been doing throughout my life from being a martial arts teacher to being a delivery guy to working for a bakery and delivering bread and then also talking to thousands of people every weekend at their farmer's market selling thousands of dollars worth of bread like these were the skills that built up into what I'm doing now and it wasn't something I could have figured out from high school and I dropped out of college so I really had to have faith in myself and, and put myself to the test. And I'm not perfect. I'm definitely lazy, probably smoke uh, too much weed. But as far as um, my life is going, I think I've had some amazing opportunities that I just can't help but be so tremendously grateful. And the more I've put myself out there, the more the right people have come to meet me, like people that really I never expected, you know, like, especially with relationships, like I've always been very kind of uh, terrible at relationships, uh, just, you know, never had like that coach that I needed, I guess. Uh, but over the past year, like just by doing this and being myself and finding my purpose, I found like a newfound confidence and, and really coming into my own. And I'm noticing like, oh, yeah, I'm starting to attract attention from people who are like minded, which is something I really didn't believe in before like I used to think I was like kind of isolated like because yeah. I would talk about this stuff on dates with women that I would meet on freaking tinder and they'd be like why are you talking about aliens 30 minutes into you know, <laughs> and I'm like I'm just trying to get the ball rolling here like you're telling me about like you're telling me about your 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 summer class like I don't care you know let's talk about the universe you know like so I, I've just always been a strange guy Bootsy Dude, it's okay. I can totally relate, man. I, I'm flashing back to like one night when I was with this girl I had a huge crush on and she was real cute. We went out and hanging out at the bar, whatever, kissing at the bar. She comes back to my house and then I start 
launching into a diatribe about, you know, like spirituality and balance and all this kind of stuff. And like, just totally like, she was like, just not into it. She just dipped. And you you know, know what? And I don't want to give the wrong impression though, because I, there are women out there who are super sure. interested in this stuff and I've met them too. Uh, so yeah, but it's like, there was this kind of, there is this evaluation that needs to be done of like, which thoughts are self defeating, which thoughts that I have, which associations that I'm making with certain emotions, where are they self-sabotaging me? And in, in that case, I did kind of have that like, uh, you know, lonely cat lady mentality about being a, a conspiracy theorist. Like, oh, nobody wants to come see me because my house smells like cats, but I can't get rid of my cats because I love them, you know? And yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah, that's how I am with my conspiracies. Like, yeah, they stink a little bit, but I'm not going to get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, dude, absolutely. As you And as you should, right? Like taking those steps, I think that that is what attracts people to us, right? Like when you're on purpose and you're like charging forward and you're like, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to stop and just reroute, you know, like, I think we even be become tested at times about that. It's like in David Data's book, the way of the superior man, I don't know if you've ever read it or heard of it. I highly recommend it, dude, for any male, female, doesn't matter, but it's a, it's written from a masculine perspective to a masculine individual. And it's really, he dives into a lot of purpose stuff. And he, he says that, uh, you know, the, the the partner in your life doesn't wants to be your number one relationship but not your number one meaning you should have something that you're really going after for you and at the, that is very attractive you know to to people in general right not even regardless of the dating romantic uh, stigma but just the fact that you're doing this thing i'm charged up i'm excited talking to you about this community that you're putting together i'm very much a community guy myself so i really see us as having a bunch of small you know autonomous communities that work together and cross over and share and do those types of things as we continue to move forward into the future with this centralized craziness then we can break off into smaller groups come together go apart you know i really am interested in interdependence and uh you know because it took me forever to, to learn how not to be codependent. I was like, well, if, you know, I just wanted to jump straight into interdependence and, and you have to become independent before you can become interdependent. There's just no shortcut there. And I've spent a lot of time banging my head against the wall trying to disprove that theory. Uh, and it has uh, completely blown up in my face. But as a result of that, I've learned some incredibly valuable lessons and it's put me in a position where you know, I can, I can kind of understand the process a little bit more. I uh, have a little bit, a, a few more pain points than the average bear does around that. So, you know, when it comes to people, I can usually help them out with that, but I just love what you're doing. I love that you're building a community. Alt Media United sounds amazing. I would love to help and be a part of that in any way that I possibly could. And, uh, you know, just kind of seeing how um, all these amazing human beings who are curious uh, and, 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 and thirsty and hungry for the truth are really starting to relate to one another. So my next question to you, I guess, is, is how did you, how did, how did you kind of start into, cause you seem, you're young. You're not, you're, you're not, you're a young guy. What are you in your mid twenties, something like that? Yeah. I'll be 27 in October. Yeah. So, you know, so you have a bit of a leg up on a lot of people, or at least, you know, for me, like I didn't really get into this stuff until I was about 30, you know, and then I dove deep and hard and got wrecked. <laughs> Crippling depression was the name of the game for me. But, um, but you know, ultimately, that's why I kind of got into self-help and, and understanding purpose and those types of things, because I because I needed to, again, you know, pain points equal solutions, ultimately. So tell me a little bit about and tell us a little bit about how you got into asking some of these questions and in, into this uh, esoteric knowledge. So, I mean, so many things. Do you have time for me to retell my whole life story? I mean, I really think I've been like the kind of uh, just always so curious and, and curious about why I was failing, you know, and I've, I've always, you know, been hard on myself in the sense of like when things didn't happen in my life, whether it was like losing a friend at a really young age and realizing like, oh, I wasn't one of the baseball kids and I wasn't going to go and have all those friends anymore, you know, and then kind of going inside and and then being kind of, oh, I'm going to say whatever. I'm going to get a bunch of attention and be the class clown. And then that kind of imploded on itself and people like 
I don't know, maybe we're just like egos clash and I got really hurt and I went in inner again in high school. And, and what came out from that third kind of like inwardness was martial arts, because at that same time where there was like the egos clashing and people wanting to like be the funniest and make other people's feelings hurt at, in spite of other people kind of energy that was going on in my, my kind of adolescent years, I was like, there's something different that I could be doing. Like I could be learning how to defend myself. Cause I didn't want to get into fights. Like I got into fights and it didn't always end well. And so martial arts created this kind of backbone of, of like discipline in the sense of like, here's something I really want to learn. I know a use for it. Right. Cause there was things I liked learning about like animals and world history and geography at that young age. That was probably not common for someone my age, but like, I didn't know where to go with it. Like I wasn't going to become like a historian or anything or a biologist. Like I didn't feel that even though I was interesting in those subjects. So martial arts became like uh, an education, but also uh, something to practice and to do and to be good at. And as that was happening, I was also growing. I mean, I'm six, eight. So by the time I really got into uh, my fullness of a martial artist, I was also taller than most of my peers. So in that sense, I realized like this, a lot of psychological truths at a young age in the sense of like what it means to have an ego, what it means to like uh, be like the, you know, person that nobody uh, respects or to be respected, like all of these extremes of, of degrees of like who I was. And it was just very uh, tumultuous. So through all that, that storm, I found Bruce Lee. I found Taoism, right? I found cannabis. I found things that I was previously curious about, like the military and espionage had a whole new meaning. And I, I realized, like, wait, why was I so curious about that when I was a kid? Like, why was I so interested in saving the world when I was a kid? So all of these things came together with like the kind of uh, Carl Sagan, kind of Terrence McKenna, Alan Watts, kind of high school psychedelia. You know, like I was really into that on YouTube. I would go down these like psychedelia kind of rabbit holes and what is consciousness. So all of these things merged. Taoism, like I said, was a big part of it. And, and why I mentioned Taoism is because, again, I was always fascinated with animals, nature, the world around me. And Taoism brought religion back into the picture not religion but spirituality because mm -hmm. growing up catholic i had kind of had this reflex of like i'm going to be atheist because this doesn't make sense these people aren't they don't really care about me so taoism kind of and, and cannabis kind of brought this new sense of wholeness and, and connectivity to the universe that i knew was there like when i was a kid i was also very fascinated with native american culture and i saw it in there i saw like oh wow like they love animals there's this there's, there's more than just a love for animals in this culture it's like a a respect a reverence a, they're exalting them and, and that was interesting to me so again so many of these factors combining into this kind of soup that culminated in me being like out of high school captain of my wrestling team and not really doing anything like significant you know like i went to community college and i just kind of took an anthropology course and an art history course and some courses that i thought might be interesting communication which funny enough i didn't realize how important that would be but that class really was important in the sense it put me in front of people and i was like oh actually people enjoy me speaking like you know and that was a really kind of big moment for me and then um and then, yeah, so I'm in community college and I uh, run into this cat, Amos, who is a Pueblo indigenous Native American. And I'm just like trying to keep my mind off of class smoking joints like in, at the park uh, a couple of blocks away from the school and like reading books that I was actually interested in because I didn't like go and like socialize. I, I just went and found a park bench and read a book and smoked a joint because at that age I thought like, all right, well, if people are interested, they'll come to me, you know, like, I'm not going to go chasing people, even though I was kind of like, lonely. And that in that sense, Amos fit that void, he filled that void, he came up to me, he was like, Hey, what's up, man, he saw that I was reading, he saw my shirt, it was like a, a 
picture of Sitting Bull on my shirt. So as a Native American, he was interested, like, oh, look at this white dude who actually respects Native Americans enough to wear a T-shirt, you know, like uh, with Sitting Bull on it. Um, so we sparked up this conversation and it turned out like, hey, uh, this dude got out of prison. So I'm like, what's going on? Like, tell me why, you know, and I'm learning more about him. And, you know, that sounds weird. Like, oh, you met a homeless guy who got out of prison. But like the kindness and the wisdom that I felt from talking to him it was just so anachronistic to what society tells you a prisoner or a convict is like sure. so that was interesting like learning about his life and and he told me he's like hey man you know he didn't get into why he went to jail but he told me like after i got out of jail i felt like i wronged my people i wronged my community and i had to make those things right again and how he did that was he went to new haven connecticut to yale university to the temple at high street. Um, I think it's number 42. I don't remember what, or 60 some 68, I think is the address on high street of the skull and bones temple. And he would go there and he would scream Geronimo's name at the top of his lungs. Geronimo as loud as he could. So loud that it reverberated through these cheap, uh, knockoff kind of Victorian looking uh, campus buildings that were built in this 1800s. They're not old, but they look old. And the sound just reverberates through there. And I was like, wow, this guy, he's, he's got purpose, you know, like this is purpose. And the reason he did that is because Geronimo, his ancestor, not direct ancestor, but tribal ancestor, uh, skull and, and femur bones reside in their temple. They were stolen by Prescott Bush during World War I or II, I believe, uh, from Fort Sill in Oklahoma. So that right there was so profound for me because here was a guy who was bringing uh, wisdom from a culture I respected, some things I was fascinated about, and then also this conspiratorial mindset that like, I had only engaged with online. And here's a person who like took his whole life, moved, even being homeless. That's how much he sacrificed to be in New Haven, to revere his ancestor. You know, that stuck with me to this day. And, you know, for a couple of years after I met him, I stayed in touch with them. It's kind of hard to stay in touch with a homeless person, but I, I tried. And now he has his own house and he's good and all that probably has a different phone number now, but either way, he is somebody who kind of legitimized conspiracy theories for me. Cause I'm like, Oh wow, here's a direct experience of skull and bones. It's not just a rumor. Uh, and then more experiences stacked up on top of it. And then uh, eventually I find Anthony Sutton's book, the America's first establishment secret order of skull and bones uh, republished by trying day. <laughs> and that book was like, Whoa, all right, boom. Like there, there's way more to this skull and bones thing than I ever thought. And I was right there in the mix of it. And like Michael Wan and Ross Ben and all these other guys that I look up to who look around their local area and find these historic anomalies and hidden conspiracies and, you know, events that are mischaracterized and they reinvestigate, they bring life back into history in their local area. Like I felt like I could do that in New Haven and I've tried. I'm trying. <laughs> it's a long, it's a long journey. So I, I'm still not even beginning to crack that skull, uh, skull and bones eggshell open. I think it's it, what's really important for me is to uh, just kind of take things one step at a time. But it is a huge point of uh, interest for me, and it's also a big point of contempt because I feel very deeply this kind of classism that the American society that we're born into has dealt to us. And that, in my opinion, is not, if not the single source, but one of the single sources of that kind of stream of consciousness, the Hegelian dialect, this philosophy that tells people that the state is God, you know, that the state should be treated as God and, and have the authority that these divine rights to rule uh, types used to take uh, advantage of or from Egypt to Rome to France to Spain and all the rest of the scumbags. I just think, and no offense to anybody who's French, Spanish or any, it's just the blood we're talking about here. We're talking about royal, you know, 
royal families who really have so much contempt for the rest of us, even though their whole lives are propped up by us. Yeah, absolutely. Authoritarians who who benefit from all the work that we do, you know, and then just continue to exploit right. society. And like Michael with the sword, I believe that all of us have a mission to take on. And that's my mission is is to expose these things as much as I can. And I, and I realize as I'm saying that that's a tremendous undertaking. But what I've realized also is that by disseminating my heart and what I interpret with my heart, this information that I interpret with my heart and sharing it, it doesn't matter if people agree or disagree no. with me. If their heart resonates with it, they'll benefit from this information. And then as a collective, as a whole, we will all benefit from that uh, upgraded knowledge, you know? It, and and yeah man i i think that's really why uh i did this uh you know why what inspired me from the beginning you know it, that was a changing point and around that time i also met someone who like gave me my first crystal and crystals just like really i don't know if i'm just like the best candidate for a placebo effect but like crystals have been a huge source of uh synchronicity and inspiration for me and now i have like hundreds of them in my room uh this one is one of my favorites this one i got from alex gray uh at cosm uh, oh, a buddy of mine was there and, and gave it to me shout out to him if he's ever listened to this i oh, yeah i don't know if i don't even remember his name but he was a cool ass dude all those people at cosm were very cool but yeah crystal uh, crystals were a big part of it too. But as I got a little more uh, in the heady community, I realized there's a lot of people who are just kind of like selling crystals and that's not a good vibe. So I, I just, I'm into crystals, but I'm not into that like festival community of like uh, gem shows are great, but like the, the whole like, Oh, like let's go take Molly and, put a crystal on our forehead and talk about dmt aliens i'm just like this is all this is all nonsense which is why i had john potash on my show because his whole thing is like drugs as weapons against us and if you look at me i you know the a couple episodes before that i had a cannabis historian so like i'm a huge advocate for marijuana but i'm also very cautious about drugs so like these are all the things I'm talking about on my show and like things that I'm interested in, like there's really no limits. It's just about like, I guess, overcoming the matrix. That's kind of what I put in my description for my podcast is like, you know, understanding the world around us and then how to overcome, right. And overcome this matrix that we're born into. Dude, that's beautiful, man. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Like I, and that's, you know, I resonate so much with that. And just, I think that, you know, the more and more of us who who live with purpose and, and do the thing that we're here to do, the better the world gets, you know, like I kind of view myself as like a part of the apocalypse staffing agency, sort of, so to speak, you know, it's like each and every one of us, we have something to contribute and everybody's got their different thing, you know, and so I love the fact that you're open minded enough to have people with different perspectives and ideas on the show. And you're really, you know, driving uh, to, to get this information disseminated and out there. That's dude, that's what it's all about. That's what it takes. And you're on purpose, you're doing your thing. I think that's, I think it's fucking awesome, man. And I'm, I'm just really encouraged to be able to sit here and chat with you and smoking Thank that you. blunt, man. I'm feeling a little jealous. <laughs> oh yeah. Thank you. you know, blow Thank me you. a shotgun through the camera here. You know? <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I had to kind of like uh, take a little, take a little step back from that, you know, because I don't know that I don't I, see. I don't believe that drugs are weapons or they're good, right? Like I don't really believe either one. I think, you know, relatively speaking, everything is a tool, just depending on how you use it, right? Like I could use guns as an example here, you know, and I could go into like some comedy about like how guns don't kill people, guns help people, kill people, but. <sighs> you know, really the truth of the matter is, is a tool is a tool and it just depends on how you use it. You could use any number of things to like whip cream in the fridge. You could get high off of that, or you could whip up some uh, pecan pie. You I'm know? in the nutmeg state. You can get high <laughs> off nutmeg. 
<laughs> Bet you didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that. But it doesn't surprise me. You know, there's like so many different things that you could do and use. And I'm certainly n- uh, not against you know, using psychedelics. Uh, I went through that phase. It wasn't for me in high school, but like the Terrence McKenna and Robert Anton Wilson, Timothy Leary. I've taken so much from Robert. I, maybe I mischaracterized that. I was smoking pot in high school. I was not doing acid or mushrooms in high school. I waited until I was like 20, 21, 22 for that. So right just to yeah. clarify in case my mom hears this. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I like it. Me too. And mushrooms at one point, uh, I was ha- having a lot of fun with mushrooms in college and they told me to, to quit school. And, and I did, and I wound up going back and, uh, and to your point about, you know, like kind of how all these random skills and things that we've picked up along the way come in handy. Like I wound up going back to school for recreation and leisure studies, which sounds like the dumbest major ever. And uh, it's basically duck, duck, goose for ad- adults in a lot of ways, but my co-host has the same major. So <laughs> I, I, I can't uh you know stand by those comments Bootsy I think my buddy he has a great degree <laughs> well I you know it, it actually wound up they made it really hard on us like they made us give us a lot of bu- busy work and made us do this and made us do that and uh I wound up learning a lot about group dynamics you know as far as like building a community and fostering that community how that works how people work together in a group well uh, you know what Jay all oh, my co-host Jay he learned how to uh control a canoe much better than I can. I'll say last year we capsized the canoe <laughs> all my fault. And he saved, he probably saved my life. He, he saved all the gear I had. So I love my co-host and his recreation therapy degree saved my life. <laughs> That's amazing, dude. And yeah, I mean, I can only imagine being six, eight and trying to get into a canoe. That seems like it presents some serious challenges, man. Yeah, it wasn't my fault. God made me this way. <laughs> I will say if there was a tape of that, I would watch it. <laughs> In my mind, I'm re-watching it right now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I learned a lot about just, you know, uh, Chicks Me High's flow theory, you know, flow um, is really, that's to me, and that comes back to being purposeful, you know, too. Because when you're in that like sort of zone, you know, when you're in the pocket, so to speak, like you're doing the thing, you know, and time flies kind of like it has on this podcast. We've been talking for almost an hour now and it doesn't even feel like it, you know, because I feel like we're just like in the in the zone, you know, just kind of doing this thing. And, and, and that's the type of that's the type of environment that I want to help people to create for themselves. Right. And to feel that fulfilled life, which I think, you know, is part of that pursuit of happiness. You know, everybody wants to be happy, but they just want to like wake up and feel good in there, you know, without without really even thinking about anything or why they might feel happy or why they might feel, you know, uh, disappointed or what, like that something's missing, right? Like for me, that was a big part of, of my sort of waking up process was like, something's, something's off. I don't know what it is, but there's like a, a hum, like a refrigerator hum in the background. That's like, you know, and you don't hear it until you pick up and pay attention and start to ask that question. And then at that point, you start investigating, looking behind the fridge or the oven or whatever, wherever it takes you. And then that whole process really starts to, um, you know, just kind of take on a life of its own, you know, before you know it, you're working on your podcast, your family thinks you're crazy. And uh, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're the, you're the, you're the one at uh, Thanksgiving dinner, (laughs) pointing out the uh, discrepancies between what we're being told and the truth of the reality that we're experiencing. So good on you there, man. Cheers. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, this has been such a, a fun show. I really feel like we're hitting it off and I'm looking forward to doing more shows with you, but yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I hope you don't hear my, my dad's uh, lo- like leaf blower in the background. If you do, <laughs> I can turn my level down here. But yeah, it's, uh, it's just, you know, one thing at a time. For, as far as the flow state goes, I think um, for me, what's important is like, yes, purpose. Absolutely. And sometimes we get lost in kind of evaluating ourselves, but we have to remember like, a description and a, an evaluation are not the same thing. I think sometimes we evaluate our situation 
and we mistakenly describe ourselves through that same lens, which leads to this kind of really self-defeating, self-sabotaging outlook on your, your actions in life. Like, you know, I told you before we started recording, something I've been listening to is uh, Tony Robbins' personal power. And what my assignment was yesterday was, how can you wake up and ask yourself empowering questions? Like write down five empowering questions that reframe the way you're evaluating your life. And then if you start the day off that way, it just, you know, creates a different outlook that bleeds into what you're doing. I think that's why this interview particularly felt really good for me because maybe I woke up on the good, uh, the right side of the bed this morning, (laughs) you know, (laughs) but, uh, but it's like, yeah, I I think that's something that I want to stress is like, I'm saying all this stuff. It sounds great, but I'm a work in progress. So if you're listening to my podcast, know that you're checking in for that. You're seeing a person who is also in this kind of process of learning. And I think that's what is so cool about podcasts is there's a real authenticity and relatability that manages to stream through this, you know, infrastructure of internet. You can turn on someone's podcast and get a real human experience and they don't really even know you, but you know them, you know, and, and if people get that from listening to my show and they can take something to, and build their life up into a better direction or take their life into a better direction from something they heard from a guest I had on or from myself, even God forbid, uh, you know, that's why I'm doing it, you know, because I know I've gained so much, from that same dynamic that I've engaged with in podcasting. Yeah, dude, relatable and honest, you know, just sharing coming from a place of, of, of openness and and wanting to connect. And so we, you and I get to have this great conversation and connect as if we ordinarily would, if we had a phone call, but now a bunch of other people also get to peek into that. So it is really like synergistic, as you're saying at the top, you know, win, 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 you know, because we can sit here, we can have a conversation, we can compare notes. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you've delved into that I, that I haven't, you know, and so it's, it's cool uh, to kind of compare notes and get an idea of, of where you're going and we can share and talk about things and, and then build up a, a relationship over time and people can come and be a part of that. So I think it's really special and cool. And I'm just uh, really excited for the future, even though at the beginning of, of all of this, I was pretty devastated, if I'm being honest, like if I was to look back about a year and some months ago, a couple months ago, like I was just coming off the Impractical Jokers cruise. Like I was like on fire, just like ready to rock and feeling so good about life. And then bam, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I felt like I got punched in the gut a little bit. But after I scrambled and kind of got things together, um, things started falling back into place. I got more opportunities uh, and, and had the opportunity to join uh, a network autonomy, the uh, Richard Groves thing who does uh, Grand Theft World. Part of that, you know, started meeting more and more people within that community and uh, things just started really happening Um you know, like snowballing, I would say from there, you know, like now I'm working with you before I was working with people who would come, you know, through my house and Airbnb, I was, had an Airbnb business while, while I would travel. And so people would come, they would pee in the sheets. I would wash the sheets and I would charge them extra money. And that was kind of the extent of the business. Whereas now, you know, I'm connecting with you you and so many, you know, the Grimerica guys, I'm going, you know, I'm going out there next year and I'm trying to go to pork fest and some of these other things while, while, you know, while it's still relatively easy to travel and uh, try to connect just as many people as possible and really just, you know, um, fortify the community and continue to build it. And I'm just super grateful and, and, honored to be able to, to share with people who, who get it, you know, cause I, I know that you felt isolated cause we all have. And I think that that isolation, that's that independence. That's you building that independence. You're like, well, I guess I'm alone. Nobody's really going to connect with me. And then before you know it, a guy walks up and he's like, Hey, wait a second. That's interesting. Uh, tell me about your shirt there, you know, and you make a connection and things begin to evolve the way they have. So it's pretty freaking cool and pretty synchronistic as well. It's dope. You're right. You know, and it's funny you say that. Sorry. It's funny you say that because uh, 
when I got coffee today, somebody pointed out my shirt and said, what's that? And I, I just said art because I didn't really want to get into a conversation. <laughs> and I wonder how much the mask dynamic played into that because I'm naturally just like, you know, not really interested in having a conversation with a mask on. So, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I mean, and to your point about traveling, yeah, man, I, I am feeling that. I drove so much last year. Uh, when everybody was kind of freaking and locked down, like I went down to uh, Virginia for the first time. That's like the farthest south I've ever driven and made my way into D.C. and got to drive around D.C. when there was like no traffic, no pedestrians. So it was really, really awesome. And then uh, I drove all over uh the Northeast, you know, just going around through Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont. I went up to Lake Champlain for the first time. And then... Uh, and then this winter, spring, I went all the way across the uh, Midwest out to Indiana for the first time, which was awesome. So, and I just want to keep that going. So folks, if you want to help me, my transmission is really bad right now. So sign up for my Patreon so I could stay on the road, help me out. Cause this transmission is kicking my ass right now. And I'm really bummed about it, but positivity manifestation if you can't support me uh and my podcast on my patreon just send some positive vibes and, and some love my way because i'm sending it back out to you uh i feel it and i'm like a transceiver it comes in one way goes right back out i love it dude i'm right there with you and i think you're just crushing it uh, i'll be thinking about your transmission talking to my people about that one and uh yeah i just want to encourage everybody to go and check mark's workout mark steve's my family thinks I'm crazy. Uh, he's working on a bunch of different projects. You know, you've seen him all over the place. Go check him out on Tinfoil Hat. Check him out on Zero. Uh, he's on a bunch of different podcasts, had a lot of amazing guests. And this network and this community is just really coming together, I think. And I'm really proud and uh, grateful to be a part of it. So thank you so much for your time today, Mark. And I look forward to chatting with you some more, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Please, folks, like I said, check out my Patreon. Thank you for having me. You can go to my website if you want to see more. MyFamilyThinksI'mCrazy.com. I just started doing a new uh, type of podcast YouTube show where I read uh, a chapter from one of the books in my library and kind of create a visual presentation to go with it. So that's premiering today. It'll probably be out by the time this comes out. So go to my YouTube channel and check that out. And uh yeah, I'm like you said, I'm on a bunch of podcasts. I was just on the Free Thinker Society podcast for like five episodes in a row as a, a yeah. guest co-host. So check that out. Uh, Yogi Zorananda's got a new podcast that I just guested on. So yeah, please check out my website and you'll see all of that, what I've been doing and what I've been up to. Dude, that's awesome. I'll put all the links in the show notes. Thanks everybody very, very much. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>